Uh, please turn to the book of Ruth. As you do, one uh, announcement. Yesterday was uh, the last ladies' meeting of the of the year, so though I I believe they will not have any um, at the end of December. So we will also the men will also have their last meeting of the the year, their last monthly meeting of the year on Saturday, and it's a special meeting. Uh, we won't continue in the usual series we'll be doing. We've asked. Uh, somebody to come and talk to us about uh, uh, I think multiplying streams of income as the as the head of the home so all men please take note even if you've never attended one you're welcome to be a part of that meeting that's 7 a.m. to 8:30 a.m. on uh, Saturday at the home I think the venue will be here uh, but the details can be clarified we are taking a break from John for a while to visit another book, and it is uh, this book of Ruth. In fact, we are, we are moving into the other testament all together. We'll be going through the book of Ruth over the coming weeks. Freeman, the song leader, had asked me on Monday night what that's uh, almost a week ago now what my theme would be for sunday uh, today so that he could align the songs and his song leading to that theme and um, uh, what i'm speaking of is completely different from what i told him a week ago he has learned the hard way not to ask a preacher on monday what he'll be preaching on on sunday the spirit might just speak to the preacher on Saturday, which is what happened to me. So we should have been in John 13 this morning, but God spoke to me, and I got a word from the Lord. Um, why the book of Ruth? Well, first of all, you know, John, as I had been saying as we're going through John 13, that uh, John 12, that John 12 is really a turning point in the book, and so I thought it would be a very good opportunity to step away before we get into the five chapters where Jesus is speaking, is in conversation with his disciples, so quite heavy. I thought before we venture into that, uh, we could take a break and maybe uh, get into John 13 next year. But why, why Ruth? Ruth is a powerful story uh, in our Bibles about love. It's a story about redemption. It's a story about restoration. I went through it devotionally about this time last year, and I found it to be quite a gem in my own life. And I hope you will be blessed as we spend some time together going through this book. Secondly, why Ruth? As we enter this uh, festive season, this Christmas period, and think about Christ's birth, I find the book of Ruth to be appropriate because of the words that are found in Ruth chapter 4 and verse 13. And when I read this, when I was going through it devotionally, it was about this time last year, so it was close to Christmas, and I couldn't help thinking of the birth of Jesus when I came across these words. Ruth 4, verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed is the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. May his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son 
has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. I, uh, I couldn't help but think about the birth of Jesus Christ and what that meant to me and what that means to Christians when I read these words. What I'd like us to do this morning is familiarize ourselves with the story and then uh, get a big picture of the book in terms of its overall themes as well as suggest some ideas for what this book contributes to the Old Testament and even to the whole story of the Bible. The book of Ruth begins on a tragic note. It is about an, uh, an Israelite family that relocates from Israel to escape famine in Israel. And uh, they seek solace in the country of Mo Moab. The, the head of the family was Elimelech, and he and his wife Naomi, we are told, have two sons, Malon and Kilion, and in time, we are told that Elimelech dies while they're in Moab, and afterwards, his two sons marry, Kilion and Malon, or Malon and Kilion in that uh, order, probably Malon being the firstborn. They marry Moabite women, they're in Moab, and uh, these women are named Ruth and Opa. However, within 10 years, the two sons follow their father and they die also so that Naomi is left with her two daughters-in-law. Naomi decides then to return to Israel with, her two, with the two young widows uh, following after hearing that things have improved in the land of Israel. And along the way, she releases the two uh, widows, her daughters-in-law, and tells them to return to Moab and make something of, of, of their lives. And uh, perhaps find husbands, since they are still young and they have not had any children yet. When Naomi saw how... Uh, uh, determined these two women were, I mean, they turned down the offer and they insist on going with their mother-in-law to Israel. So most of us don't realize that Opa also refused initially to go back. They both refused. And uh, she, Naomi insisted. Opa gave in. Forgive me if I call her Oprah. In my notes, I think I've even called her Oprah. She's Opa. But uh, Opa refuses, and, and uh, initially, both of them refuse initially. Uh, Naomi insists, and Opa gives in and, get, and goes back to Moab. However, Ruth insists on staying with her mother-in-law. And when Naomi sees how determined Ruth is to remain with her and go back to Israel with her, she agrees, and so they return to Judah in Israel, to start life afresh together there. They return to Israel at a time of harvest, but they do not have any food, they do not have any money, and so Ruth goes out into the fields where she follows after harvesters, who according to Israelite law were not, uh, were not permitted to get all the harvest out of the fields, but whatever drops to the ground should be left, and it's left for the poor. And so Ruth, being in that category, with, uh, goes out into the fields and picks up the remains of the harvest, field after field. And she ends up in a field of a man named Boaz, who falls in love with her, and she falls in love with him, and they get married and they basically live happily ever after. So this story begins with tragedy, but it ends in joy. Now, let's talk a bit about its place in the storyline of the Bible. What, what is this book contributing 
to the storyline of the Bible. I hope you know that the Bible is, of course, several books, but uh, it is, in fact, a library of books, but actually, it is one storyline. We believe that the Bible, although it is comprised of different books by different authors, has one ultimate author, has one actual author, and it is God. That as these writers wrote these words, including this very book, they were being led by the Holy Spirit so that their writings were inspired by God or breathed out by God. And uh, the book of Ruth is particularly strategic in the unfolding story of the Bible. And what we see, actually Jesus claimed that the storyline of the Bible really is about him, his person and his work. And this book of Ruth is strategic in where it sits in regard to the storyline of the Bible, which is really the story of Jesus Christ. Its place in the big story of the Bible is made clear in, actually in Ruth chapter 4, right at the end of the book, we really see the role that the book of Ruth is playing in the storyline of the Bible. Ruth uh, 4 verse 13 says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went in to her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Jump to verse 16. The Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. I want to suggest to you that that is what this book is doing in our Bible. In other words, the famous King David who killed Goliath, that David's great-grandfather was Boaz. And that David's great-grandmother was Ruth, the character in this story. And the reason this is significant is because the Messiah was to come from the line of David. The Messiah was to be a son of David a descendant of David. So the book of Ruth establishes the legal ancestry of Jesus Christ. But it does more than that. Read on verse 18. Now these are the generations of Perez. It, it, from nowhere, the writer introduces a, a whole new character in his book. Now these are the generations of Perez, Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nation, Nation fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. And uh, the book ends there. Why is the writer introducing a completely new character, Perez, and telling us how Perez is connected to Boaz, who is connected to David? It is because Perez's grandfather was Jacob. And Jacob's grandfather was a man named Abraham. In other words, the book of Ruth connects Jesus to David, and the book of uh, and it even connects Jesus all the way back to Abraham. And Matthew one verse one makes this point because he, Matthew begins his gospel this way: the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The book of Ruth helps us establish the ancestral line of Jesus, but it does a bit more than that. The second thing 
we could say it does, is it, it, it's got a strategic place in the Old Testament particularly because it helps us understand the political development of the nation of Israel, particularly from judges to kings. Look at how it begins. We've looked at how it ends, and we've seen how it connects Jesus to David and to Abraham. But look at how it begins. The very, open, the very first line of, of the book of Ruth, Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, in the days when the judges ruled. So the book of Ruth begins by telling us that the events that it describes take place at a time when there were judges. There were no kings in Israel. And it ends by telling us about the, the great king of Israel, David. And so it's really making, drawing that political transition for us from the judges to the kings. The nation of Israel had a very humble beginning. It, it all started with one man who we've talked about, Abraham, who was an idolater. He was worshiping idols, and he got a tap on his shoulder from God, who made a promise to him and, and gave him a command to relocate, to move away from his home, because God had special plans for him to make him into a great nation that becomes the nation of Israel. And uh, Abraham had a son, Isaac. Isaac had a son, Jacob. Uh, uh, and Jacob had 12 sons. And these 12 sons have uh, descendants who become the 12 tribes of Israel. But when they grow into a, a nation, they're actually in Egypt. And they are enslaved in Egypt. And God remembers after hundreds of years, he's promised to Abraham, and he goes to fetch the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, out of the land of Egypt. And when they come out of Egypt, they do not have a king. They are a unique nation. Whereas most nations had kings, Israel had no king, and God wanted it that way. And so instead of kings, they had judges. Only later, when they asked God for a king, was a king given to them who was Saul, and then Saul was replaced with the great King David. The book of Ruth helps us see that uh, connection. So that's something about how, what the book adds to the Old Testament, what the book adds to the Bible as a whole. Let's now look at the major themes of Ruth. Major themes of Ruth. There are some overt themes. These are themes that you can't miss. They're screaming at you in the book. And there are some covert themes, some hidden themes that you sort of need to read the book with a, with, with a careful eye to see. A few overt themes. There is the theme very clearly of sorrow and grief. That's where this book begins. It begins on a very grave note, on a very sad note. And there's so much to learn here about how to handle suffering and how to suffer well. Especially from the example of Naomi. There is a theme here of love and courtship. Boaz and Ruth's story is one of the famous love stories of the Bible. And there's so much in this book to learn also about uh, finding a partner, about uh, seeking a partner, about the kinds of partners that one needs to, to, to look for. There's also a theme here, very overtly, that screams at us about redemption and about restoration. Naomi loses a husband and sons at the beginning of the story. At the end of the story, you know what she says? I've been given a son again. Very clearly, Naomi, Naomi's situation is redeemed. Naomi is, is, is restored. We'll explore these themes because they, they, they scream at us in the book. But there are some more salient Themes, some more hidden themes that I would want to point out. 
Let me give you a few of these. First, there is the theme of God's sovereignty. When we say God is sovereign, what we are saying is that God is in charge, that God rules. In fact, we are saying that God is the highest rule. To reign is to rule. To be sovereign is to be the highest rule. That God is the highest rule. In fact, God has a prominent role in this book. There is so much that God is actually said to do. There is so much that the book says he is doing. That in the midst of the hurt and the pain of Naomi, God has taken... Has, has not taken a nap that God is actually very active and he is in full control. God is actually quite busy in the book of Ruth. Look at Ruth chapter 1, where we are told that it is actually God who inflicts the suffering on Naomi. At least that's Naomi's theology. Chapter 1 and verse 13 Naomi is speaking and she's saying, would you therefore wait till they were grown? She's still asking her daughters-in-law, why, you know, go. Why should you stick around? Are you going to wait until I, I, bear, I bear more sons and then you, you wait for those sons to grow and then you marry them? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake. And listen to this, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. That's, that's how she resolves her sorrow and her suffering. It's not a, a demon who's done this. It's not witchcraft. It's God. God has come after me. God has gone out against me. Look at verse 20 and verse 21. She said to them, and now this is to the, 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 the people in Judah, where she arrives, in Bethlehem, actually, where she was from. So already you are seeing that connection to Jesus. She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? When the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. It's God who's done this. God is active even in the restoration of food to Israel. Remember, why did Naomi live with her husband and her two sons? Because there was famine in Israel. Or well, look at the language used when the famine is taken away. Chapter 1, verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that what? That the Lord had visited his people and given, given them food. Are you seeing this theology of the sovereignty of God in this book? It's God who restores food to the land of Israel. Israel. And by implication, it is God who took the food away by sending the famine. God is very active in this book. So there's this hidden theme. There's this sort of a salient theme. And you can miss it as you are reading it because you are so fixed on the sorrow of Ruth and the, the love story between Boaz and Ruth that you miss out on all the things that the book is telling us God is doing. God is the one bringing hardship on this family and sorrow. He's gone out against this family. He's the one who's brought the famine and he's the one who takes the famine away. Second hidden theme is a theme of worthiness. Worthiness. And I won't say much about it, but I'll just point it to you because we'll explore it as we uh, study it together. But look at... Uh, it's interesting that in the book, both Ruth, is, both Ruth and Boaz are called worthy people. Boaz is called a worthy man, and Ruth is called a worthy woman. Ruth 1 verse 20. 
Oh, sorry, Ruth 1 verse uh, 6. No, sorry, Ruth 2 verse 1. Ruth 2 verse 1, here is where Boaz is, is called uh, a worthy man. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a what? A worthy man of the clan of Elimelech whose name was Boaz. And you don't think much of it until you get to chapter 3 verse 11. Where if you are reading carefully and it's stuck with you that Boaz is called a worthy man, this will jump at you in chapter 3, verse 11. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you, this is Boaz speaking to Ruth, I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are what? A worthy woman. So this couple that is formed, we're not just talking of a guy who was just one amongst the guys or a girl who was one amongst the girls. There was something about the character of these two individuals that made them outstanding individuals. Even though as we will see, as we read and study the book together, especially their love story, it would appear from what the writer is telling us in the book that others did not think that of them. They were both single when they met. And uh, Boaz is, is, is chuffed at the fact that Ruth shows interest in him. And of course, nobody's looking at Ruth. And yet she, these are two worthy people. Third, and uh, possibly the most important hidden theme is the theme of providence. Providence. Ruth 2 and verse 2. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, to her Go, my daughter. So Ruth says, Look, we, we need food. Naomi says, Go and, uh, and find some. Verse 3. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field. After the reapers, and she happened to come, take note of the word happened, she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. And Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? What's providence? Providence is the idea that the world is, is, is increasingly rejecting. What's providence? Though it's taken from two words. Pro, meaning before, and a Latin word which, from which we get our, our word video, meaning to see. So it means to see before. That's the, that's the raw meaning of the word. Theologically, the, the word providence and doctrinally, what, what it means is, is a, 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 little, a lot more than God just seeing before. It, it actually means God having an active hand in everything that happens. It means that nothing else happens outside of God's control. Nothing happens by chance. All the occurrences of this world, everything that happens, happens by God's bidding, by God's plan. He, he, it happens because he wants it to happen. I, I like to think of it because, you know, it's providence. I like to think of it... Uh, or, or remember its definition by using the word provide. That God, all circumstances in your life, all circumstances in my life are provided by God. All circumstances are within God's provision. Whether they are good or whether they are bad. So the circumstances that have been a feature in your life are all within God's providence. 
Were you born uh, to, in, in a poor family? Do you, are you coming from a poor background, perhaps born an orphan? That was all in God's provision. That was all in God's providence. Those circumstances uh, come directly from God. Do you have a background of hardship in your life? That's from God. Or maybe you have a background of wealth in your life. That is from God. Born into a wealthy family. All things occur within the providence of God. The change of government that we had. That wasn't, you know, we think, well, uh, uh, what's his name? HH had a robust movement on Facebook and he put all these things in place. And that is why he won. No, the people were fed up. The previous government messed up. All those things might be true on an earthly level, but there is a, 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 a truth on, an, on, on a heavenly level that God provided those circumstances. Everything that happened, even in the change of government, was within the provision of God. The, the challenges that we've had in the last two years as an entire globe, COVID-19 and the havoc that it has brought are all within the providence of God. But let me tell you, the world rejects God's providence, and increasingly so. We can see it in the belief that many have that there is no God, or that if he is there, he is unconcerned with human affairs. He's doing his own thing. He's busy with his own interests. The world just falls into circumstances and he's detached from it. But we also see it in the beliefs we have that even though many of us agree in sentiment that God is in control, in practice we deny it. When we look at how we actually think, how we actually react to the circumstances of life, even though, especially as, as Zambians who are particularly religious, everybody says, oh, God is in control. No, no, this is, you know, God is seeing, God is looking, God is in control. Practically, we don't actually believe it, even though we say it with our lips. A false rumor circulated a few weeks ago, <clears throat> in the first week of November, I think it was, that our area MP had died. Levi Mukandawire. We're, we're praying for his family uh, during the service. But it was a false rumor circulating that he had died. And uh, he, uh, very soon, outlets were saying, no, he's alive. And he himself recorded a video and posted it on his page saying, uh, I am alive. Here I am, Levi Mukandawire, uh, fully alive. Don't believe those rumors. I'm alive. And everybody said, uh, perfect, great. And now, uh, and this past week on Thursday, he was uh, coming from a constitu constituency meeting with some of the leaders in the constituency in the morning. He, he leaves them at 12 o'clock, just around noon, and says, I need to prepare for parliament. We have a meeting uh, this uh, afternoon. And he drives to ho his home. And as he is opening his gate manually, he jumps out of his car to open his gate, a car comes speeding and hits into his car and knocks, hits into him and knocks him against a pillar and the pillar falls on his head and uh, I hear it crushes his head or something like that. I don't think there'll be any body viewing and he dies. Now, our, our African um, superstition be began to kick in, right? People were saying, no, there's something wrong here. Three weeks ago, this man is rumored dead, and now he's, he's dead for real. In fact, someone posted that finally he has died, implying that uh, people wanted his life. And even he began to think in that way clearly because uh, he posted something about when, they were, when he had, after posting the video and saying, I'm alive. He, he posted something on his page saying, my enemies will not see my coffin, something like that. Well, whoever those enemies are, they, are, they will see his coffin now. And I, I was browsing through the comments because I was trying to, at first I just said he had died. I was trying to see how did he die. I didn't know how he died. 
And I was just looking at the comments. And, you, you, and, and, and people were saying all sorts of things. Witchcraft. How can a man who three weeks ago was rumored dead, now he's dead. This is witchcraft. People just wanted him dead. And people were thinking that he was murdered. And they wanted the driver of that car who had even run uh, away. Who happened to be a woman. Rumored to be dead a few weeks ago and now really dead. It had, it had to be assassins or witchcraft. But here's the interesting thing. I did not see a single comment from the hundreds that said the Lord has done this. No comment saying this is God's providence. Not even a suggestion. Could it be in God's providence that this is not, witch, not witchcraft, this is not uh, an assassination, this is just God saying that this is how this man will die. Three weeks after he is rumored dead, he will die. This is God's providence. Imagine if Naomi was Zambia. Her husband dies, and then her only two sons die. What would people be proposing in Zambia? You know what we propose to each other. I've organized a sangoma in the, in the bush somewhere between Kabwe and Lusaka. You turn left after 15 kilometers, or is it left is where? This you turn left after 15 kilometers, and we need to get rid of these uh, spirits that might be causing this. And we've brought that into the church that now the Sangoma is the pastor. And you take this person to the pastor so that we remove these spirits. Otherwise, even you, you know, even you will die. Even now your, your aunties and your relatives, will, the spirit will also attack them. And their husbands and their sons will also die. This is how we think to this day in Zambia. And what is it? It's a rejection of providence. So we can't point at the West and say, look, they are atheists. They don't even think about God and, 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 you know, factor God into what is happening. They reject his very existence. We in Africa do the very same thing, but in a completely different way. We reject the providence of God. Why don't we factor his providence into our thought process. This is what Naomi did. This is from God. This is within God's provision. And this book of Ruth um, has a subtle theme because providence is not just negative. Providence can also, I know I've been talking about it just in terms of the bad, but it is also true of the good. Providence is the idea that God provides all circumstances, good or bad. And I want you, I want you to see at least the, 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 the good, the provision of, of positive providence, favorable providence in this book. We see the bad providence very clearly. But look at the the, the subtle mention of positive providence. God providing good circumstances. Ruth chapter 2. <clears throat> I, I made reference to it in the reading that we, we just had. So Ruth 2 verse 3 says, So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened. Remember what did I say? Take note of that word. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you, and they answered, The Lord bless you. Just at the moment when Ruth came to the field of Boaz, remember she was gleaning field after field, go through this one's field, and then that one's field, and then that one's field, and so on and so forth. But just at the point, when she reaches the field of Boaz, just at the point, at that point, Boaz comes home from work. A few minutes earlier or later, and they would have missed each other. A few minutes earlier or later, this great love story would not be there in our Bibles. 
a few moments too early or too late, and there would be no obed. Because there would have been no Boaz and Ruth getting married. And if you don't have an Obed, you don't have a Jesse. You don't have a Jesse, you don't have a David. You don't have a David. You don't have an ancestral line for the Lord Jesus Christ. Did Jesus' ancestral line really just depend on a chance meeting between these two people? Was it just a, a matter of seconds or a matter of minutes or half an hour and we, would, and, and we would not have this ancestral line of Jesus Christ? Did it really boil down to chance? If you are reading the book of Ruth correctly, you have to say no. But let me stretch your mind even further. Where would David be if in God's providence, Naomi's sons never died? Where would David be if Ruth did not insist on going with her mother-in-law to Israel? Remember, her mother-in-law told her and Oprah, not Oprah, her and Oprah, go back. I've got nothing to offer you. Better you go back to your home, to Moab, and find husbands there and make something of what is left of your life. Where would we be? And, op and they both refused and, uh, to go back. And Naomi said, no, you just have to go back. One of them goes back. What if Ruth also went back with Opa? Where would, where would David be? But let me stretch your mind just one more step further. Where would we be? Where would we be? The book of Ruth shows us how carefully God had arranged for the life and death of Jesus Christ. It, it's, it goes all the way back to the book of Ruth. It goes hundreds and hundreds of years back to this tragedy in this book. Ruth had no idea that from the loss of her first husband would come a marriage to a man who would be the legal ancestor of the Savior, Jesus Christ. But it was all in the providence of God. Brothers and sisters, there is wisdom in trusting the providence of God. Our view is far too limited. We see the immediate. We see what's happening now. And sometimes we get so worked up by it. But we have no idea what the implication, what, what God is doing through the circumstances he's bringing up upon us now. What God might be doing a hundred years from now. What God might be doing when we are long gone. Even your death. Let's suppose you die. And you, you leave your children whom you so love and care about behind. You would not have it that way. But you have no idea what God is doing. We see the immediate. We must trust the providence of God. If God could work out a savior to save us from our sin so intricately, so deliberately, so comprehensively, how could he possibly fail to bring good from the worst circumstances in our lives? What a book. What a message. A message about a God who secures a savior to save us hundreds and hundreds of years before his birth by securing an ancestral line for him. God has gone to great lengths to prepare our Savior, to prepare a Savior for you and me. And, and this Christmas, 
this festive season, may it not pass us by without us trusting in him alone for our salvation. Because if God can organize a savior in this comprehensive and deliberate and intricate way, surely he can bring us to heaven. Ours is to trust him and trust in the provision of this savior, Jesus Christ. Because for us to read the book of Ruth and see God tying all these ends so that we get our savior clean from the line of David, a son of David, to save us from our sins. If God can do all this, he does not need a, a single ounce of our help. And that's why he calls on us to say, I've done the work. I've done the work all the way back from the book of Ruth. All you need to do is not, is not try and come up with some work for, for you to do as well. All you need to do is trust in this Savior who I have provided in this intricate way. All you need to do is ask for forgiveness of sin. The very sins that left him no choice but to leave the comforts of heaven to come and to die so that we could be saved. May the Lord himself help us appreciate his son Jesus Christ who died to save us. I hope that whets your appetite for what lies ahead in this book. Let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your providence and for this book that uh, really puts your providence on loudspeaker, hinting all throughout that even in these terrible circumstances, you were in full control. You knew what you were doing. And that Naomi couldn't see it, Ruth couldn't see it, Boaz couldn't see it. But even the tragedy in the lives of Naomi and Ruth were used to bring about the ancestral line of Jesus Christ, our Savior. The only way that we can be saved. Father, we pray that as we think about our own lives, our own circumstances, and as we are tempted to think that the good is only a result of our efforts, maybe that the bad is only the result of bad luck and people who wish evil upon us and witchcraft, that we'll be reminded from this book about providence, that we might believe and, and as it were, embrace this doctrine, that not only are you in charge, not only does everything happen according to your plan, but you have a good plan, that all things work together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And many of us will never see those good things that you are working out in the circumstances of our lives in our lifetime, but give us the grace to trust that you know what you're doing, and you're doing something good. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, let me ask that uh, we, we sing Trials Dark on Every Hand.